suburban hell went through a little phase where people were trying to find the worst examples of that and that was that was one of them but uh, there's certainly <laughs> others uh, that's one of the things that really frustrates me yeah. about so many suburbs is that um I think actually the channel Oh the Urbanity made uh, I think it was them that made a video about this that like everybody hates cars like right. even suburbanites don't like cars they want to drive they just don't want anyone else to drive Hi everyone welcome to the Active Towns podcast conversations about creating a culture of activity my name is John Zimmerman. I'm the founder of the Active Towns Initiative, and I'm honored to serve as your host each week on this podcast journey. Thank you so much for tuning in. It's always wonderful to have you along for the ride. Today is Wednesday, December 22nd, 2021, and this is a truly special bonus video that I'm sneaking in before the end of the year. I recorded this conversation with Jason last week, and the official release of the audio version of this episode, number 109 in the series, won't be released until Friday, February 11th, 2022. So this is truly an exclusive early release for my Patreon supporters and subscribers here on the Active Towns YouTube channel. In this episode, Jason gives a quick update on the Not Just Bikes channel and provides some background information on a new platform where fans can enjoy his content. Then we dive deep into discussing the hidden in plain sight secrets of success to the Dutch Bicycle Network. How some very simple to conceive yet difficult to accomplish strategies make their approach to network design so effective across all mobility modes. But before we roll into those discussions, please allow me a brief moment to mention that this very special episode is being brought to you by the generous contributions of our donors, sponsors, and monthly patrons on our Patreon page. Now, if you too are in the spirit of giving this holiday season, and really any time of year, please head over to my website at activetowns.org and navigate to the donation page. Please know that every contribution, no matter how small, is greatly appreciated and really has a very big impact on my ability to continue doing this work. Another way you can help is by simply subscribing to the channel here on YouTube and be sure to ring that bell next to the subscribe button to get a friendly little notification when I post new content. And finally, if you enjoy this video and find it useful, please share it within your network. Thank you all so much for tuning in and for whatever support you're able to provide as I strive to grow this movement to create a culture of activity for all ages and abilities. Okay, let's get this conversation with Jason Slaughter of Not Just Bikes rolling. Well, it's an absolute pleasure to have you back on to the podcast. Jason Slaughter, thank you so much for joining me once again on the Active Towns podcast. Thanks for having me. Well, hey, uh, <laughs> obviously, most of the audience is familiar with who you are. Uh, you were on back in uh, July. Uh, and, and in fact, I'll, I'll, I'll pull this up because this is the, uh, um, the, 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 the actual landing page for the, the website when, uh, when we posted that. So uh, oh, yeah. that, that was so incredibly uh, wonderful that you were able to do that. Um, but why don't you do this? Why don't you just give a, a quick 30 second overview of who you are and then sort of bring us up to speed in terms of what's new since uh, July? Because I know there's some new stuff. Yeah. Has it been since July? It, yeah. geez, it feels like it was sooner, but uh, I guess I guess it was about July, wasn't it? Yeah, it sure was. Um, so my name is Jason Slaughter. I run a YouTube channel called um, Not Just Bikes, which has become... Um, unexpectedly popular. Uh, I talk about urban planning, urban design, and mobility uh, using the Netherlands as a gold standard. Uh, so that's not just bikes on YouTube. Um, and uh, I mean, what's new since since I was last here? It's It's been, it's been kind of crazy with the channel. Um, I know uh, there's been a huge jump in subscribers. It's at 460,000 now or something like that. Lots of videos have gone over a million, two million views. Um, I recently got my stuff up on uh, Nebula, which uh, you know is a is a streaming platform that's run by creators, uh, which is really great. So uh, a lot of my content is there, ad free, and I'm gonna do some Nebula originals as well. I hope. Uh, so that's pretty exciting as well. Uh, Nebula app slash not just bikes if you're interested. And um, yeah, I mean, it's it's been really, really busy. I've been doing lots of collabs too that are going to come out soon, and um, and I'm pretty excited about that. So, but it's 
it's actually gotten kind of crazy lately just uh just how busy things are with the with the channel fantastic yeah and uh, i'll make sure that oh yes I... actually now that i think about it i have i have merch now too oh and um, you have merch <laughs> yeah that's right yeah <laughs> and i, I love that as, as i pick up my mug <laughs> Why don't you show that mug too? Uh, and, uh, yeah, sure. This is uh, if, if you can't walk to a taco shop, it's time to move. Exactly. <laughs> um, so that's merch.notjustbikes.com. But <laughs> well, and and one of them says it is is like a play on the taco thing. It's isn't it like nacho bikes or something Na like that? Nachos bikes, yeah. Nachos, nachos, bikes. nachos <laughs> bikes, yeah. So I got that here. There's the other side of it. <laughs> yeah. well, you, you can see it there, but. Uh, Anyway, yeah, that's been that's been kind of fun as well. I've got some some T-shirts uh, that are kind of tongue in cheek as well. So uh, that, that's uh, I had some people ask me about that. I always thought merch is a little bit silly, but you know what? I actually it's kind of fun. It's it's yeah. uh, if you if you use it as an opportunity to have some little in jokes and stuff like that, it's uh, it's kind of fun. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah, I, I don't have much in the way of merch myself. I've got uh, uh, Active Towns uh, stickers and, and and a hat and, and a few other things. Um, but uh, uh, yeah, it's I, I don't have people knocking down the doors uh, to, to grab it. But at the same time, it's nice to be able to to have it there. It, more more than anything, I give it as as thank yous to to some no, of my donors. Good. So yeah, it's it's nice having that. So. Take a second just to talk a little bit about the Nebula um, uh, platform. I, I, I poked around just a little bit on there. You, you had sent a, a very nice um, uh, email out to all the Patreon supporters and uh, and indicated that supporters, friends of of the the Not Just Bikes channel um, and platform, uh, actually receive a, a, a I think a forty percent discount on, on the the monthly fee. Yeah, right now it's forty two percent, which is kind of crazy. Yeah, yeah. So what's the background um, with this platform? Uh, so Nebula is actually super interesting. Um, it's uh, it's a, a streaming platform that was started by creators. Uh, a bunch of YouTube creators got together and decided that uh, they wanted to make their own streaming platform, which is, which is kind of crazy, right? Like YouTube is the platform and there's pretty much nothing else out there anywhere near that size. Um, but they decided to make their own. And what's really interesting about it is that it's owned and... Um, and operated by the creators themselves, um, which which makes it very creator friendly, but it also just makes it very viewer friendly as well. Like, so you've got a platform where uh, you don't have to deal with a lot of the sort of the pain that YouTube can bring. I mean, YouTube is an amazing platform. Don't get me wrong. I mean, the number of videos and potential audience is absolutely massive, right? Like, it's estimated that 500 hours of video is uploaded to YouTube every minute, and some of it is not terrible too, right? So. <laughs> Um, there's, uh, but YouTube has challenges. Like when you're a creator, you always have to be worried about demonetization or copyright trolls or all sorts of like issues that you can have, uh, uploading your content. And my content seems to be generally okay. But if you're making, for instance, like, you know, historical war documentaries, it's really hard to stay on the right side of, of YouTube because, you know, they have a problem separating promoting violence versus talking about historical violence for example and there's lots of other examples as well so um nebula is a platform that lets creators just make what they want to make um without worrying about uh demonetization or any of the other issues that you can run into with youtube and the the profits from the views are shared with the creators um so people can uh, can sign up to ne a nebula it's it's very cost effective actually compared to other streaming services and um, and they can get all the create the the um, videos from their favorite educational creators like completely uh, ad free uh, as well as lots of extra content as well that you won't find on YouTube for various reasons. Um, they have even mini documentaries like City Beautiful has a great one called the uh, what was it called I think it's called the planning oh yeah planning in ancient Rome and um, and it's great it's a really great like mini documentary done by City Beautiful it's not something that's that's on YouTube. Um, yeah, so I actually, I've been really happy with Nebula myself because I actually signed up with a City Beautiful code, like, I don't know what it was, like last year or something like that. And and it's absolutely great. Like, it's really, really great. Um, but the deal that you were talking about, it's uh, the streaming service Curiosity Stream has partnered with them. Um, who And Curiosity Stream actually started by one of the guys who originally started the Discovery Channel. And it's really great, too. It's got all sorts of um, 
educational documentaries um, and like long form educational content. And, uh, and they've partnered with Nebula. So when you sign up to Curiosity Stream, you get Nebula for free. Uh, yeah, so it's, it's actually honestly really great. The deal that's on right now um, is 42% off, as, as you mentioned, which is if you go to curiositystream.com slash not just bikes, uh, you'll get 42% off, which is $12 a year for both services. Like that's crazy cheap right now, $12 right. a year. Hmm. Fantastic. That's great. Well, hey, that, yeah, that anyway, is... it's a story for the ad, but uh, I, I'm yeah. actually genuinely excited about this. Like, I think these are two really great platforms and I'm super happy about uh, having my stuff on Nebula. Well, I, I could tell that you were excited. That's why I wanted to make sure that we, uh, we talked a little mm -hmm. bit more about it since you mentioned it. And uh, yeah. because I did, I, I, I had a sense that that was one of the biggest uh, new things that uh, has, has come up for you. So good stuff. Yeah. That's great. I mean, the thing is, um, just like one more thing on it, like mm -hmm. one of the things with YouTube is I never use music in my videos. Now, I don't really love music in videos, period. Like, right. that's not my thing. But I don't use music in my videos sort of ever. And part of the reason for that is because I can't even count the number of times creators have had uh, videos demonetized or even completely removed from YouTube because they used a piece of music. Uh, like, I remember one of the Minecraft uh, YouTubers that... Um, that my kids used to watch called mumbo jumbo he used this he licensed a track and used it in his intro on all his videos right and it turned out that the the person he licensed it from used a sample from a song from the 70s that a company went on to buy and then claimed the copyright on so <sighs> here's here's the guy licensing a piece of music for his intro like yeah. paying for it licensing right. it no idea that that creator who created that piece of music used a piece of a, uh, a sample from somewhere else, a little guitar riff. Right, right. And it ended up that every single one of his videos, literally thousands of videos, yeah, all were demonetized all at once. And he had to go through and manually cut out the intro yeah. of thousands of videos. Yeah. And that's the kind of thing that's just, it's just so broken that that kind of thing can happen. And that's a risk that creators use. You know, Adam something put out a Dubai video. He used a clip from... Um, from Hungary from the 60s that he didn't have properly licensed a video with 9 million views he had to get rid of it hmm. you know because of because of one like like 4 second clip of video yeah yeah interesting yeah there you go there you go well we were going to talk deep about infrastructure um gosh I, I i tweeted something out you know maybe a month or two ago and and uh, and also commented on just the fact that uh, our interview from from back in July is my most watched and most listened to uh, podcast <laughs> episode ever. And you you sort of pinged me back and said, "Hey, let, I'll I'll come back on. Let's let's but let's dive deep into some infrastructure yeah. stuff." The so, the condition was that I'll, I'll come back on, but we can't talk about me. We need yeah, to talk exactly. about something other than me because <laughs> I'm getting tired of going on podcasts and doing like, "Whoa, my name's Jason, and I live in the Netherlands." Yeah, ah, yeah. Come on. like how many times do people need to hear about me? Let's talk about something important. Exactly. Well, and and more importantly, we did talk about you for about an hour and, and the videos too uh, last time. So go back if you haven't seen that that episode. Definitely go back and and check it out. It's really super entertaining. People are enjoying it, uh, and uh, it's well worth the time. So I appreciate you doing just the quick uh, ele elevator pitch version of uh, who is Jason. And, uh, and one of the throw things the that, in there too. <laughs> what's that? You let me throw the ad in there, too. And I let you throw the ad in there, too. <laughs> <laughs> it's all good. <laughs> hey, you got to pay the bills. <laughs> but one of the things that uh, you and I sort of honed in on that was really, really cool about, um, you know, active towns related infrastructure. And that really means that infrastructure, the way cities are built, that help encourage active living and just active mobility and being yeah. able to just sneak activity into your life without even like thinking of it because it, you're just going about your day. And uh, you had mentioned uh, this concept that the Dutch use of teasing out, uh, you know, the different mobility networks. And, and we're going to, we'll dive deeper into that. But I want to start by actually playing a short video that you produced prior mm -hmm. to doing that one. And this was really about... Uh, I, I think it was early on and you wanted to capture, uh, you know, that feeling of, 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 of all of this. And it, it's called the best way to cycle. 
So oh, I've, yeah. got that, I've got that video queued up. We're going to pull it through. I'll play the music so you can, we, we can actually hear, or not the music, I'll play the, the audio yeah, so we can music. actually, you know, hear the narration. And so the audience can, can, you know, can get a sense as to what's in this video, especially if they haven't seen it yet. And it's not yeah. one of the most uh, watched videos out there. So uh, all the better to, to give it some uh, additional play here. But this really sets up the next video that we'll talk into, which is, is, or talk about, which is really that concept of teasing out, uh, you know, the different infrastructure, uh, the different networks that are there. So let's, let's pull this one up here real quick. Okay. And press play. That I want to cover on this YouTube channel. The very first thing I ever, before I had an intro after moving here was bicycle only roads, because despite visiting the Netherlands a half dozen times, and of course, watching lots of bicycle Dutch videos, it's just surprising how great these are. Now that we've been living in Amsterdam for a while, this topic seems almost too boring to cover. <laughs> I take these routes several times per week, and I've come to expect them wherever I travel. Yeah, I do take that road a lot. So for this video, I'm going to try to remember how excited I used to be before this became just another part of my everyday experience. Fish and water. I mean, seriously, <laughs> isn't this great? Yes, it is. The Crow Manual refers to these as bicycle highways, but that word is almost always used to talk about national cycle routes between cities, not My copy's right behind me. So I, I filmed video, that clip I'm of the Crow Manual backwards. As I, bicycle road. I closed the book. You can register yeah. your and then complaint about my incorrect reversed it because it's easier to get it below. right. But yeah. Anyway. Now, every city I've ever lived in had recreational trails or multi use trails, but these bicycle roads are different. And these aren't like the London Cycle Super Highways either, which are, of course, the stupidest name for any bicycle infrastructure ever. <laughs> Tell us how you Those really feel. Super yeah, highways glad I still had are attitude back then. the same as regular old Dutch cycle paths that you'll find along any major road in the Netherlands. Yeah. The biggest difference is that while other cities put bicycle trails where they're easy to build, such as along a former rail line or through a park, these bicycle roads are part of a wider network and are explicitly built to connect to destinations you'd actually want to go to, such as a sports arena, a park, a school, a swimming pool, or a hospital. So I find myself using them regularly because they're the fastest and most convenient way to get to where I need to be. Mobility scooter there. Exactly. Bicycle roads are designed to the high... I'm gonna pause just a second here. Yep. That, that clip that we just went through, as I was watching through this again this past week, I was like, okay, were these previously roads that had multiple types of motor vehicle traffic and then were converted? Because yeah. some of them are. You can tell when you're on some of them. And then some of them aren't necessarily. Yeah. Now it just transitioned well, that... over to you know, where we're in the, the railway corridor. So. Yeah, this used to be a wider railway corridor, and there's still yeah. off to the left there. Um, there's a historic tram that runs there on Sundays. You're right. Um, that they were actually going to get rid of, but then people were like, "No, we love our historic tram," um, which is cool. Yeah. But uh, the one before was actually in Amsterdam Zuidost, in near mm-hmm. the Bijlmermeer. At the Bijlmer is um, an interesting place. There's actually a 99% invisible podcast about it that that people can check out if they're interested. Um, but um, that area was built that way from the start. Got it. Um, because they had this idea at the time uh, that was a good idea. That wasn't being used everywhere, but they had this idea at the time that um, that you could build a a city where the walking and cycling was on the ground, mm-hmm. and then everything else was raised up. So there's like uh, there's a metro that's raised up above the ground. There's highways right. and roads raised up above the ground. Um, so th- they kind of built this this unbundling concept in there right from the start, which um, was quite progressive uh, for the time, for sure. Um, The name name of this in Dutch is called Onflechten, uh, which we Mm. won't bother trying to use again, but Onflechten is is how it's said in Dutch. It doesn't really translate well. It's uh, people translate it as unbundling or disentangling. Um, But the idea, it's it's kind of like what you would do with your headphones when you pull them out of your pocket, right? right. That's the word that, uh, that they mean, basically. But it's effectively separating and taking things and, and pulling them apart so that they're separate when they used to be wrapped together. Right, right. 
I'm going to press play on this again because it, it, right around the three minute mark is is a classic quote that uh, that you have on here. So I want to make sure we hit to that. I haven't watched this video in a while. Wherever just... possible. That means they're at least two meters wide in each direction with smooth red asphalt and without any barriers or sharp turns. This makes them That's extremely true. safe, even by Dutch standards. They even take into consideration breaking the wind so that it doesn't get too windy along the route. It doesn't get any better than this for cycling. That is true. This kind of network totally changed cycling for me. I've never considered myself much of a cyclist. I prefer trams and trains. I I've ridden bicycles in many of the places I've lived, but Man, I never really enjoyed it very much. Yeah. I mean, I, hated I like the section. exercise, sure, but I generally did it because it was faster yeah, than the painfully slow public transportation that was always stuck in traffic. This is when it. I ride a bicycle in Amsterdam, it's still because it's the fastest way to get around. But when I'm on a bicycle road, I actually enjoy it. I never realized how much of my time cycling was spent worrying about cars. Even if you're in a protected bicycle lane, there are still side streets, and driveways, and parked vans, and junctions. But on a bicycle road, you can quickly and easily get from point A to point B and never cross paths with a car. When a bicycle road meets up with a car. So I wanted to pause uh, on yep. that because I thought that was a, a very, very important thing that, uh, that you brought up is, and, and that was, and that was actually a, a, a Dutch example of a protected uh, bikeway. Um, but to your point, yeah. <laughs> there's lots and lots of driveways. There's lots of delivery vehicles. There's lots of things happening. Yeah. And so it's, it's one of the the challenges that that we of course have when we think about redesigning our streets and redesigning uh, our networks is the fact that just slapping down protected and separated infrastructure, if it's still in a really chaotic and uh, you know car choked corridor, <laughs> it's nowhere near as uh, you know comfortable and inviting. To your point, because you know. Yeah. You talked about how, uh, you know, how much more pleasant it is. Yeah. So the thing that the Dutch realized, um, when they started building proper infrastructure, uh, was that the best thing to do was to separate what they called fast traffic and slow traffic. Um, and separating traffic by speed is a major part of their road safety, um, plans. And of course, um, bicycles, you know, considered slow traffic. So, Separating them is the best way to do it, which is where you get the feet's pad, the, the bicycle path that's that's up on top of the curb. Um, that's where you get that philosophy. But even better than separating by a curb is separating completely by the route so that right. the route that a car takes and the route that a bicycle takes are completely separate. And that, that's what we're seeing here. That street that I showed in that video is a particularly busy street. Like you, you can yeah. see it. There's lots of shops, and there's there's a road there. There's a, a tram line, I believe, and um, and th there's a lot of things going on. So it is going to be more chaotic. And I actually find that um, I mean, this is a common problem in Amsterdam. A lot of the Fietspaden are are too uh, are too narrow the, for the amount of traffic that they get. So you know it's a luxury to have, but y you get problems where a protected bicycle path that in any other country would be perfectly fine, except maybe in Denmark or something. Um, but in Amsterdam, like once you get traffic there with bulk, uh, with so many bicycles, it just, it's, it's too narrow. And that, and that's an example of, of one of those. It's just an older bicycle path from, you know, the, when you build infrastructure is going to be around for like 30 years, right? Like right. The, it, because unless there's some unusual circumstance that the road gets redesigned, you, you're pretty much Amsterdam, same as anywhere else. Uh, will redesign their roads when it's time to resurface them, which is about every 30 years, de depending on traffic. Maybe if it's light traffic, you get to 50. But uh, and and that's what Strong Towns talks about too. That you know this is what's important is, is supporting that infrastructure forever, basically. Um, so there's still older infrastructure in Amsterdam that's been around for 20 or 30 years, and and that's an example of of one of them. It's just too narrow. Uh, it makes a huge difference. Like it really, really does. I can't stress this enough. But I remember this even. Um, in Toronto, like anybody who lives in Toronto, you think about coming down Harvard Street uh, east, and then it turns into Queens Park into a, a two-way cycling path that's totally separated from the cars. And I remember when I used to ride that home from from work. As soon as I hit that spot, it was like I could feel my blood blood pressure just drop, <laughs> like right. because it was it was it was noticeable. It was just right. like suddenly, 
Oh, okay. All right. Well, I don't have to so I've got the much, I've but... got the other video queued up, and yep. and in it sh- in this video you get a little bit of that because that oh, exact yeah. feeling of you I know, was you're... probably thinking exactly that love while going from Harvard Street to Queens Park. Well, or and or you know in the the Dutch example or the the Amsterdam yep. example, you're you know you're out in the chaos of the city, and then all of a sudden you're in the Vondel Park. Yes. And you're like, yes. yes. Exactly the same kind of feeling. Yeah. Okay. Let's cue this up. All right. And <laughs> you're at all with bicycle infrastructure, then you're familiar with separated bicycle paths. In most cities, these are considered the gold standard for bicycle Great infrastructure, and with good reason. In general, if you want to keep people on bicycles safe from two-ton death machines, you want to physically separate them and not this put them in a painted too. bicycle gutter. Yeah. But what's also great is when you can cycle to wherever you're going and almost never encounter a car at all. It might not look like it, but this is bicycle infrastructure. Yeah. And so is this. And this. What you're seeing here, or rather not seeing, is the Dutch concept of onflechten, which in this Sorry. context yeah. means disentangling. I'll explain how that works, but first we need to understand how most other cities do things. In a typical yeah, city, a there will be roads yeah. and every. Yeah. Yeah, so uh, this, this actually is one of the challenges that I think most cities have, especially in North America. Um, you know, I, I get to it here in the video, but... I, I want to stress it because I don't think I necessarily mentioned it well enough here. The, the problem that we have with separating routes is that right now in most North American cities and many other cities, uh, cars can go everywhere, right? Right. Like there's no limit to where you can drive, literally no limit. If there's a road, you can drive there. Yeah. Um, you know, unless there happens to be a cul-de-sac there, you, I mean, even then you can go and turn around it, but whatever. But the, the point is cars can go everywhere. Yeah. And if there's a street grid, cars can go everywhere. And if there's, you know, whatever, cars can go everywhere. So when you talk about putting down bike infrastructure, cars are everywhere. Right. So you just need to put it next to the cars. There's there's not really this opportunity to have a different route because we've built it such that cars go everywhere. Yeah. Uh, and that that's the big challenge. Well, one of the things that's interesting is that we just saw a few images in there um, where we're looking at, uh, you know, very, very traffic calmed, very, very slow streets. We see that there are some cars parked there, but you yep. also see that the entire uh, street was paved in in red bricks, which means that yep. that's, you know, that's a, a, a bike priority street. And um, the, you know, the expectation, of course, is that the motor vehicle drivers um, are allowed, but they are the guest. And so they can, they can, they can make it to that area, but this is not a through street for them. They're yeah. probably uh, it, just accessing parking. They're probably, you know. Yeah. So anyways. The, the bricks don't always mean that it's a Fitzrat, um, but it, in those in right. those cases, I don't think they were. But what the bricks do tell you is that they don't get a lot of traffic because right. um, bricks are not used. Actually, so bricks are uh, much more cost effective for the city over a long period of time. And when you do work on it, you just pull them up and then put them right back and it's yeah. as good as new. And Bricks are great, but you can only do it up to a certain level of traffic. And after that, you need asphalt. Right. Um, so when you see the bricks, you know that it has to be a relatively low traffic street. Um, the other thing that the bricks are great for is making noise. So right. drivers drive over them and you hear them through your car and you're more, you, you realize subconsciously, if not consciously, right. that you're driving quickly over bricks. Yeah, yeah, good stuff. You actually do, by the way, in this video, I, I know it's been a while since you've probably seen it, uh, but you actually do a fantastic job of, of describing much of what you just said. So let's... Uh, let's okay, let's well, this of what vehicle let's see what I said. <laughs> yeah. If this route gets too jammed up, then people will just cut through this neighborhood over here. I love mm. it. <laughs> the rat run. This yeah. free-for-all strongly encourages driving, which generates insane amounts of car traffic and ultimately leads to busy, congested streets that are highly unpleasant to be around. The suburban cul-de-sac neighborhood acknowledges this problem and solves it by making driving routes so circuitous and convoluted that nobody but residents will be I able love to this figure seg- them out. this segment of this. Unfortunately, yeah. it does this for everyone, so distances become completely impractical to walk or cycle, which encourages even more driving, traffic, and car dependency. Here is an example from the subreddit Suburban Hell. These two houses in Florida <laughs> share a backyard. But it would take yeah, over two hours ridiculous. to walk between. This is ridiculous. The Dutch take a very different. Holy heck! You've got to be <laughs> yeah. kidding me. 
suburban hell went through a little phase where people were trying to find the worst examples of that and that was that was one of them but uh, there's certainly <laughs> others uh, that's one of the things that really frustrates me yeah. about so many suburbs is that um I think actually the channel Oh the Urbanity made uh, I think it was them that made a video about this that like everybody hates cars like right. even suburbanites don't like cars they want to drive they just don't want anyone else to drive so right. when they build those suburban neighborhoods with all the twisty streets and the cul-de-sacs the reason they do that is because is to cut down through traffic like that's right. it they make it too complicated to figure out how to get to where you're going unless you live there right. that's that's the reason it's done that way and it's it's crazy because um, there's so many instances, though, when you get to suburbia that like there'll be houses right up next to a commercial property of some kind, like a grocery store or something or a strip mall. And you can't walk to it because right. there'll be a fence and a ditch. Right. And it's like that's the most frustrating thing ever, because it's literally like I can see it. It's right there. I can right. see the building I want to go to, but I can't get to it because they've fenced it off. Right. And it's that kind of thing that's just it frustrates me so much because. Yeah. You could actually cut down car traffic by just plowing a little path through there, multi-use path, let people walk or cycle between the neighborhood and the and the um, the shops. And, you know, it's not going to solve the world's problems, but there's going to be a non-zero number of people who will walk there to get the shopping instead of getting in their car and driving through the neighborhood and out onto the arterial road and everything else to, to get there, right. which is just one more car clogging up everything. And that's one of those things I talked about in my video about um, why I love driving in the Netherlands, in in car dependent places, you just you need to drive to everything, e right. even if something is like whatever, 600, 800 meters away, you can't walk there, you just can't walk there. Yeah. And yeah. it's just so frustrating to me that you have to get in the car and drive. And, you know, it may be 800 meters to walk, but to drive, it's going to be two and a half kilometers, or two kilometers or something like that, because you have to go all around in twisting circles and everything. It, yeah. It's just so frustrating. It's such an incredible missed opportunity. I feel like every yeah. one of those cul-de-sacs should have a path at the end that just goes straight through to the cul-de-sac on the other side. And and if you did that everywhere, that alone would let people just connect better. Right. But um, but yeah, it's it's frustrating. And so this video then kind of gives us it, it it continues on and gives us the kind of the alternative to that like, not all routes are accessible by car nice. this isn't done randomly or just when residents complain rather there is a conscious effort to separate or disentangle these routes taken by car drivers from those taken by everyone else just like you were saying in effect yeah. designing completely different road networks for different types of traffic these are called Hofnets, or main networks, and most Dutch cities have them. For example, here is the Hofnet plan for Sertogenbos. Okay, for now. And here is the plan for Amsterdam. The Amsterdam plan goes a step further by designating parts of the network as plus nets, which specify which form of traffic gets the highest priority along the route, including things like traffic signal timing. And when a street is redesigned, the plus net will define the priority of how the space is allocated. For example, this street in Amsterdam is part of both the bicycle and tram plus nets, so one lane of cars has been removed completely to give more room for cyclists and to give trams their own lane. Yeah. If you want to learn more about the distinction between plus nets and hoof nets, the city has published a thrilling 80-page document. <laughs> what I love about that, that little segment there is it, it just talked a little bit about how flexible some of the existing street space can be if you just reimagine it. Different networks yeah. for different types of traffic. Amsterdam has hofnets for cars, bicycles, public transportation, and walking. The implications of see that is brilliant. Yeah, that that uh, those series of, yeah. of slides that you put together there is so cool because it really exemplifies and illustrates just the overlaying of all of these different uh, networks that are in place. Yeah. And I, and I think that's really important. And that's something that's not commonly seen in North American cities. Like, I don't think you could say to them, like, what's your primary walking plan? Like, like this one here, you can see, um, this is mostly for the center. Once you get out of the center, it, it, it tends to be just sidewalks along roads and things right. like that. But, yeah. but what this is saying here is that these are priority corridors for people who are walking and all the green spots are, um, parks that, that you can walk through. But the point is, is that they've made a network for walking so that you can um, you can always 
connect from you know point A to point B, and there's going to be a good quality walking path for you. And you know that does that doesn't mean there's just physically a sidewalk. It means it's it's a high quality walking path um, that is interesting and safe and continuous. Um, so that that's something that once you start consciously tracking that, then you can evaluate that network and see you know where the where the problem spots are and things like that so of course um amsterdam does that there are some problem spots for walking where things aren't as pleasant as they should be and you know in some cases they'll they plan to remove cars uh from certain streets because you know the sidewalks are too small or or they plan to um limit car traffic put bicycles onto the street and expand the sidewalks or whatever it might be but the, what whatever they decide is based upon these plans of which mode of transportation is considered the highest priority on this particular route. Right, yeah. Here's an example of a street in the car network during rush hour. And here's an example of the street in the bicycle network just around the corner. It's literally <laughs> It's clear here, from the volume right. of traffic which form of transportation is being favored here. Bicycle networks also incorporate bicycle-only roads wherever possible sometimes separated from the car network by underpasses, removing the requirement for a stoplight completely. It's also common for the network... And you do have an entire uh, episode or, or video talking about stoplights, so I do encourage folks to, <laughs> to get over there and check that out. Because one of the, one of the great things about the way, the, the way that they're approaching the stoplights is they're doing them intelligently. So, yeah, yeah. Yeah, and actually, and it's a similar kind of thing. Um, there's uh, there's like a bicycle priority lights, um, which uh, my my traffic light video mentions, um, where because they expect a large amount of cyclists to come from one direction, they'll put yeah. loops in the ground that detect the cyclists, like not at the traffic light. Well, they do have them at, but they'll also have yeah. them like back several meters from the traffic light. Right. So they can detect if a group of cyclists are coming and turn the light green for them so that they get priority to go through and it just pushes that bicycle traffic through and then when the loops discover that uh that the cyclists have passed then it will turn it green for the cars again and, um yeah. i good. mean it's just it's just crazy it, it, it's it's not rocket science the technology right like it's just loops in the ground but instead yeah. of having just one at the stop line they'll have two three sometimes even four back from it and for cars as well so they can tell, you know, there's a car coming through now, right. uh, and the uh, the traffic light can tell. I know at least whatever three loops back, there's no cars, and that's enough stopping distance for the traffic uh, control system to turn the light red for the cars. Right. Um, which is just genius. It's not difficult, like from an right. electrical engineering point of view in a system, it's fairly simple, yeah. but it works so well. Now I can't remember. Did you mention um, the rainy conditions uh, in Rotterdam and how the lights stay uh, green longer for the, or they adjust the no, timing I, for I the don't, cyclists? I, don't, I think I, I I mention it at the very end as sort of like a, there's other topics to discuss. I mentioned right. that one that um, when it's raining, it's my, the, it's the lights will stay green that, longer yeah. for cyclists. Yeah. Uh, the other one that I I sort of like passively mentioned at the end. Um, and since then I've actually gone to film. So I have to make a video about this someday is the, uh, um, is the all, always green that, um, that they have in, um, in Groningen, uh, that, uh, there'll be stoplights that will be you know, your regular stoplights, but then, um, for cyclists, they'll go green in all directions at once, but only for cyclists uh, yes. because, because yeah. bicycles aren't cars, right? They don't need traffic lights. Like this is another thing that, that just drives me nuts about North America. They they treat bicycles as as vehicles, and right. so they take all the rules for cars and apply them to bicycles, which is insane because bicycles are not cars. The, the reason, the only reason we have traffic lights at all is because cars are dangerous. That's it. Like right. before cars, we didn't need traffic lights, and you don't need traffic lights for bicycles. We see this all the time in my footage here. You'll see me go through bicycle only intersections, and there's just yield triangles, and that's it. Like because you don't need you don't need traffic lights for bicycles. Right, so right. what Croningen does is they just have the lights go green in all directions for bicycles because people figure it out when you're going slow and you're on a very maneuverable bicycle, you can just go get somebody's coming at you, you, you pause a little bit, they'll go a little faster and you and it's incredible. It's like it's like watching a ballet when you watch it, but it's, it's really not that difficult to do like that. I, I've uh, when I was in Croningen watching it, you know, you'll see 90 year old ladies on their little Oma feats 
with their groceries and they and they're like going through this intersection with hundreds of cyclists in all directions it looks crazy yeah. but it's not not as crazy as i think it's just that we've got it set in our minds in north america that bicycles are vehicles and so they need to stop at stop signs and find follow red lights and then all this stuff it's it's mind like ugh, just drives me crazy <laughs> Bicycles are not cars, and they shouldn't have to follow the same rules as cars. It, it's inefficient yeah. to do so, too. Anyway, uh, yeah. Anyway, yeah. don't get me started. Yeah, exactly. And speaking of Vondel Park, yep. For walking and cycling to purposefully cross through city parks, making it even more pleasant to walk and cycle through the city. Mm -hmm. These routes are enforced in many different ways. Sometimes it's with signs, and sometimes it's with physical barriers. This is not a new concept. Even the Romans did it to keep carriage traffic out of certain areas. I actually went to Urban Pompeii uh, the other week. Filtered oh, cool. yeah. But the important thing to note here is that this is not being done haphazardly. It's specifically done to encourage traffic along a network. For example, here is a street with filtered permeability in our old neighborhood in Toronto that lets pedestrians and cyclists through, but not drivers. This thing was such a mess But this only Toronto. happened after years of residents fighting with traffic engineers. Right, exactly. There here in go. the oh. Netherlands, Filtered permeability is built in everywhere and specifically designed to encourage different types of traffic along designated routes. This often allows cyclists and public transportation users to take the fastest and most direct route to where no they are stop, going, no stop while car there, traffic no is allowed lanes. only for local destinations. For example, here's how I... And before we go go into, this is the, the, the map, obviously, of, of the route of you getting up to... Uh, uh, yeah, your, your, your place where you had a, a contract and you were heading up there. Um, but I wanted to, to pause real quick to talk about, um, you mentioned no lights there and no stop sign. You have an entire video just about no stop signs. Yeah. <laughs> so yeah, stop signs are stupid. Yeah, exactly. I, yeah. I mean, I was, I was in Paris the other week, uh, filming a video, which actually comes out. Um, well, I think it'll be out by the time this podcast is out because it's coming out in a couple of days, but, um, um, I went to Paris you know, Paris is a city with over 2 million people. They don't have a single stop sign. So right. I just, when, when North Americans tell me, oh no, we need stop signs here. It's not safe without stop signs. Like, ah, okay. Like 2 million people, no stop signs at all. Right. Zero. So it's, anyway, stop signs are stupid. <laughs> yeah. 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 And we, it, who knows, we, we might get into a, a place where we can, you know, talk about uh, the traffic calming because part of, part of the reason why so many cities can get away with not having stop signs and not having signal signalized intersections is they really do a good job at traffic calming. And so the fact that the motor vehicles just aren't simply traveling at those types of dangerous speeds. So yeah, there's, a lot of stuff that you can do. Okay, let's roll yeah. this because we're going to talk about your little uh, commute that you did for a while. Oh, yes. It was a while ago. Routes. This often allows cyclists and public transportation users to take the fastest and most direct route to where they are going, while car traffic is allowed only for local destinations. For example, here's how I cycle to a meeting in Nord. And mm -hmm. here's how I drive there. Here's how I cycle to a friend's house. And here's how I drive there. Here's how I cycle to Ikea, and here's how I drive there. You might think that this situation is bad for car drivers, but ultimately it's not. If there were a direct route to drive everywhere, then most of these people on bicycles and trams would be driving too, and the street would be so congested that it would take ages to drive anywhere. In fact, and that's what you yeah. mentioned earlier is, is just the fact yeah. that, you know, because there are so many different alternatives and, uh, and, and I was sort of confusing, um, the fact that you had a video just about your, your commute and, and, and all the different ways that you could get to your commute and, and the fact yeah. that you were, able that was to, near to, where I worked, but it, not exactly. That was actually a different meeting that I yeah, went to yeah. once and it, but it occurred to me because I actually went there a couple of times. I, right. I, I did cycle there a couple of times and I drove a couple of times, yeah. um, simply because I was too late to be able to cycle. I picked up a car share car. Um, and, and that's where, that's the route that I really thought like, wow, I'm taking a totally different route to this place, like right. completely different. And the driving route was great. It's along a really yeah. nice highway, some great condition, great quality roads. The, the bicycle right, uh, road um, route was great too. Yeah. Well, what's great about this series uh, uh, is, is that it was like everyday kind of trips, you know, or, or yeah. you know, being able to go to this destination, et cetera. And this is how I would go if I drove, and this is how I would yeah. go by bike. 
and it reinforces, you know, what you were talking about uh, in in terms of um, having those separate roots. But the other thing that became quite obvious about it is that it was it was clear that the prioritization is leaning towards a more direct route route for the people on bikes. Yeah. Um, so, I mean, I think this is what I'm going to talk about right here in this video as soon as you play it. But uh, the, I, I, I've talked about this before in my videos. There, there really aren't that many car people, bike people, train right. people, unicycle people, whatever. Um, there's most people really don't care. Right. Like even people who drive all the time and say they love their car, they don't actually love their car. Like when, when they're driving like a, a 15 year old Toyota Camry, they don't actually like cars. Right. They just like getting to where they're going quickly and efficiently. And people will take the route that's quick and efficient. The vast majority of people. Yeah. There's always, there's some people who are going to cycle no matter what. There's some people who are going to drive no matter what, but that they're actually in the minority. I, I firmly believe this after visiting so many places in the world. Like when you go to Tokyo, there's a hell of a lot of people that take the train. Right. And it's not because they love trains. They're not a bunch of foamers. You know, right. like they they want to just get to where they're going quickly and efficiently. And the city has been built such that the fastest way to get there is the train. And the same thing in Amsterdam. Like when people are riding these like 70-year-old beat-up Oma feet with a paint chipping off of it, they don't like bicycles. They don't give right. a crap about bicycles. They may say they like their bicycle, but they don't actually mean they like their bicycle. They like the fact that their bicycle gets them to where they're going quickly and efficiently. Yeah. And yeah. The, this, is, this is where it's up to the city to decide what are you going to make the quick and easy way? Like, are you going to make it transit? Are you going to make it cycling? Or are you going to make it driving? And in North America, that answer is almost always universally, you're going to make it easier to drive. Right. When cars can go everywhere and cars can take the direct route everywhere, why wouldn't you drive especially if, if parking is free that's like literally the only metric that stops people from driving in north america most of the time either crippling congestion i guess is the other one but it's parking if parking is free and available i, I mean you'd kind of be stupid not to drive right right um but when parking is rare expensive or there's lots of congestion then people say you know you know what it's faster for me to ride a bike than to drive. And that was the case for me in Toronto, for instance, you know, I worked in downtown Toronto and I could drive to work. Um, I remember it would take me about 25 minutes, but if I rode a bike, it was well, usually less than 20 minutes. Right. Um, just because of the crippling traffic, but it's not because the city designed it that way. It's just that the, the city has invested so little in their public transportation over the past few decades that, that traffic is crippling and then other modes become, um, uh, uh, well, driving becomes um, other modes to driving rather become more interesting. And the thing is here in the Netherlands, they don't let the crippling traffic. Well, they used to, as you can see in this photo. Yeah, I mean, that's, that's they don't why let the crippling traffic be this. the thing. Yeah. yeah, they don't let the crippling traffic be the thing that um, causes people to decide I'm not going to drive. They say they say specifically, no, the fastest way is good to get there is going to be by, say, bicycle. Right. That's the direct route. If you want to drive, that's fine, but you're going to have to take the long way around. Right. And in doing so, it drives a huge number of people to ride bicycles. Right. Because again, the vast majority of people really don't care. Right. Yeah, yeah. And and I appreciate, <laughs> and, and, and I'm glad that you reinforce that, that this isn't about, quote unquote, bike people or train people. It, no, I, I am mean, not a bike person. People are just, yeah, exactly. I mean, this is just a pragmatic decision. You know, it's like, hey, this is the easiest, most comfortable most pragmatic way of getting from point A to point B. And yeah. it, it's just a bonus that, you know, it's, it's a little bit more enjoyable too. So there you go. Yeah. Yeah. Let's see what else you have to say here. I can't remember what happens after this. I also can't remember. That was the situation here in Amsterdam in the 1970s. There you go. The city was so clogged with cars that the streets were not only highly inefficient, but also extremely dangerous, which is the current situation in most American and Canadian cities today drive it home. When I drive in Amsterdam, I'm amazed how little car traffic I encounter for a city of this size. Yeah, it's so true. It's also important to note that these Hofnets and Plusnets are not made as a replacement to proper bicycle infrastructure, but rather in addition to it. For example, the London Quiet Ways cycling plan was used to put cyclists on quiet streets, but it was usually done to avoid having to build proper cycling infrastructure on major roads. 
and often prevented cyclists from taking the most direct route to their destination. That's, that's where I lived at King's Cross. In the that Netherlands, was, oh, wow. most busy streets will still have... I'm glad that you mentioned that too, because there's there's a couple of different things that end up happening, especially here in North America, is that um, most cycling infrastructure does get built, especially the on-street, um, you know, in the roadway, in the right-of-way uh, cycling infrastructure does tend to get built on the more major thoroughfares. Yeah. And um, the, that concept of of the the fact that the majority of the Dutch net network is some form of other, <laughs> you, yeah. know, you know, it's the, it's the quiet streets, it's the feet straws, it's the, yeah. you know, it's the bicycle roads that, uh, that you have, uh, have named, by the way, did you find out a, did, is there a more formal name, Dutch formal name for that? No, I mean, okay. the, they're just called bicycle highway. It, yeah. the, like it's, they don't, or they're just called feet pads. Like they right, don't, right. they don't separate the one um, in terminology. They don't separate the ones that are uh, next to the roads and the ones that are totally separate from the got roads. It, um, but one of the yeah. things, that, yeah, one of the things I wanted to point on this is that, you know, so often that's what North American cities are focused on is getting the, the bicycle infrastructure in. It's on those more major roads yeah, um, which is kind of the opposite problem that was was highlighted there with the quiet streets with London, um, but then they like totally discount or forget about the fact that, uh, especially in some of the older neighborhoods that may be gridded, that there's a whole network of quiet streets that, with appropriate traffic calming and filtering and etc., et could turn into just an extraordinary uh, asset to the city from a cycle network perspective. Yeah, so um, a couple of things on that. I mean, I know Toronto um, has tried to go down that path. The the challenge with, um, yeah, the tra challenge with doing that in North America, and certainly saw this in Toronto, there would be some anti-cycling councillors who didn't want lanes taken away on major roads, and so they would say, no, put them on the side streets. Right. Um, and they were kind of using that logic that bicycles don't belong on the major roads, they belong in the side streets, um, to not build bike infrastructure. So that's one thing is to to make sure that any sort of quiet ways is not, like I said in the video, is is not done to avoid building proper bicycle infrastructure. Correct. The problem I find with North America, though, is the stop signs. Like, right. it's when you go on those neighborhood streets, they're great, but there's a stop sign at every single intersection, every right. single one of them. And then, you know, some some grumpy old, woman who lives there and sees somebody not put their foot down and come to a complete stop on a bicycle at a stop sign which is freaking stupid i mean stops right. the bicycles move slowly they have no a pillars there's nothing in your way you don't have to come to a complete stop to stay safe you just right. know, don't blow through it at 50 kilometers an hour on your on your road bike but People and on what, bicycles and what we're seeing, shouldn't need to stop at stop signs but yeah and what we're seeing now you know across many states is the fact that they're they're making that legal they're going yeah, through that and, process of of treating stop signs as yields and and treating yeah. treating stop lights as stop signs. Yeah, yes. proceed if it's if it's safe to do so. So and th and that makes sense. And I know people get their britches in a bunch over this, <laughs> but it's really just they don't understand exactly. bicycles. Um, but if you can not have to stop at stop signs, then I agree that certainly gridded streets are like that. But the other problem, of course, is that cars are allowed everywhere. So right. So. As soon as the major road gets um, backed up, then drivers will start rat running along those side right. streets along with the cyclists, and then it, it ruins the whole thing. But if you can put um, modal filters in place right, right. Uh, that only let cyclists through or one-way streets, another thing that I will rant about, I'll try not to maybe here, but another thing is that one-way streets, in almost all cases, cyclists should be able to go the wrong way down the one-way street. That's right, another right. thing that is a holdover from treating bicycles as, as cars. And that's the thing in Amsterdam. Right. If there's a one-way street, 99.9% .9 of the time, you're allowed to go down it the wrong way on a bicycle. And that also makes a difference. So right. we do this a lot. Like the neighborhood I lived in Toronto called Riverdale had lots of alternating one-way streets. Um, mm -hmm. They were older streets. They weren't meant for the amount of traffic. So they do them one way just because two way would just not be possible with the amount of parked cars and, and cars going. So it'll be, you know, one way this way, one way that way, one way this way, one way that way which is fine. And that also provides some traffic calming and it prevents rat running, especially when one way streets sort of meet up with one another and you can't right. keep going. That's great. But they need to let cyclists 
go the wrong way down the one-way street in all cases, not right. just sometimes when they put a contraflow in all cases, then yeah, then you can have a really great network through the one-way streets. And in the case of a place like Riverdale, it's it's already, this this is what's so frustrating about it. It's already almost there with right. this Honflechten concept um, uh, in the Netherlands, almost there. Because if you are driving in Riverdale, you usually have to take your one-way street directly out to your closest arterial road and then go around. So if you need to go on the opposite side, then you need to drive out to the arterial road and drive around. If they just let cyclists go the wrong way down one-way streets, you'd have it. Yeah. You'd have it right there. Suddenly, like kids going to school, people going to the grocery store, whatever, they're going to start cycling because now that's faster. If they, you know, where, where I lived over on the west side of Riverdale, if I wanted to get over to the No Frills grocery store on the other side, um, I, I, on a bicycle, I have to go the same way as I would drive, which is stupid as hell because it's right there <laughs> if I could just go the wrong way down a one-way street. And so right, sometimes, right. of course, I would. Yeah. And then you get people who all get upset about it. Oh, my God, these bloody cyclists. And it's it's just so counterproductive because yeah. with just a few small changes, some of these neighborhoods could be so much more appealing for right. cycling. And people will do it if it's yeah. faster and more convenient. A non-trivial number of people, not everyone but a yeah. non-trivial number of people will do it. And that's the beauty too of, of the, you know, the, the traffic calming is everywhere video that you have. And I encourage folks, um, I'll, I'll make sure I have a, a link, uh, you know, to that, uh, in the, the video description for this and also in the show notes for the podcast, um, is, is that concept? No, you, <laughs> for, for those of you who are, yeah. who, are, who are typing that, that nasty gram, uh, comment right now uh, about what are you trying to do? Kill people with cyclists going the wrong way on a one-way street. We're talking yeah. about traffic calmed environments, folks. We're, we're not yeah. talking about, you know, 30, 40 miles per hour, uh, you know, sending a cyclist down. These are slower streets, you know, than what we're used to typically yeah. in North America. So like 30 kilometer per hour streets. I think that's yeah. 20 mile per hour. Um, yeah. 17. Uh, yeah. Yeah. With very limited, um, with very limited car traffic, you know, yeah. cut off to cars. Yeah. Uh, and that's so the, extremely and the limited filters traffic, that we were talking lows. about earlier. Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. All right, well, let's bring this home here. Separated bicycle path, even on routes designed for cars, unless the street is very old and hasn't been redesigned in the last 30 or 40 yeah. years. There you go. This is a 90s street, but this was acceptable in the 90s. I was absolutely right. amazed when I discovered these maps because it totally changed the way I looked at cycling in cities in the Netherlands. These routes mean that cycling in Dutch cities can be very relaxing and extremely safe, even on streets that look like they have no bicycle infrastructure because you can ride through the streets of a bicycle hoof net and hardly ever cross paths with a car at all. And see that 30 kilometer. And it's all to the invisible bicycle yeah. infrastructure that Dutch and planners use right there was to ensure that their streets bump. are as pleasant yep. and efficient as possible. Another one there over the intersection. I'd like uh, to take this opportunity to thank my supporters on Patreon. Wow, I had no patrons back. Documents from <laughs> back then, oh my God. yes. I, I just, know. <laughs> I just approved the Patreon page for my next video coming out uh, this week and the train patrons are the whole page. Like we couldn't oh, fit more that's than awesome. train that's... patrons on it. Oh my God, it's it's crazy. I think uh, I'm up to, I don't know what it is, thousands. Yeah. Well, Active Towns is a proud supporter uh, of, that's true. of uh, not just bikes on, on Patreon. And I encourage everybody in my audience, uh, not only become a patron of Active Towns, but also not just bikes. Uh, Jason, <laughs> you're doing such amazing work, and, and I really Thanks. do appreciate that uh, you're keeping the stoke, you're keeping it going, you keep producing great stuff. Uh, gosh, amazing videos just recently out, including the uh, the train plane video that came out. Uh, uh, yeah, the Italian trains. Wow, they're great high-speed trains. Man, yeah. I love those trains. Yeah, it's good stuff. And uh, true to the name of your channel and the name of your, your your content that you produce, it's not just bikes. So, so folks, if you haven't gone over there, please do check it out. It's a, a lot of really, really fun stuff. Jason, is there anything that we haven't talked about that you want to make sure that you leave the audience with here today? Um, no, I mean, there was actually just one little thing I was thinking about while watching that video is that, um, is that when I use Google Maps directions in Amsterdam. Um, they're perfectly fine. Yeah. But you can tell they're designed by Americans, like the routing and everything, because right. what it does is it takes me out of my neighborhood. It doesn't know I can go the wrong way down a one-way street. It yeah. takes me out of my neighborhood to the closest major road and puts me there Yeah, every single time. And <laughs> it's 
always the wrong way to go. Almost always. Not right. always, but almost always. Yeah, because yeah, yeah. it doesn't know I can go down the wrong way down one-way streets. And it doesn't know that it's better to be cycling um, on these side streets than it is on the main roads. Because you'll notice in Google Maps, if it's a very American concept, that there's like a solid green line for the uh, arterial roads and a mm -hmm. dotted line for the, uh, for the, you know, this is a bicycle recommended route or something like that. And in America, certainly this is the case in Toronto, usually that dotted line route is good, but you want to be on the solid line route, um, which is the better quality bicycle infrastructure. And uh, and here it's very much the opposite. I mean, you, yeah, it's perfectly fine to go out to those roads, but they're sometimes going to be busy. Um, and um, or, or, you know, the other thing, sometimes they're not. I remember when I got here, I'd ride on those and I think, wow, there's nobody out here. Where are all these cyclists? It's, I'm in Amsterdam and there's like hardly anyone cycling out here. Little did I know the only people who would be cycling on those busy roads were the people going to those busy roads, like to the shop there, right? Like they were specifically going to that street. As soon as I found these maps of the Hofnet stuff, you know, one street over, there's 10 times as many bicyclists there. Right. Um, and I'm like, oh, here's everybody because they know, right. either through looking at the maps or more likely just by learning it over time, that this is the better route to take. Um, and, and one of the big differences is that when you're on those major roads, you're with the cars, which is fine. You're separated. Right. But you hit every single stoplight. Right. Because they have all the stoplights for cars, yep, right? Yep, so yep. you can take a route and you're going to hit every light that a car is going to hit. Every single one of them. Yep. And it's so frustrating. Yep. Whereas if you're one, two blocks over where you're supposed to be, um, then there's no traffic lights at all. There's right. none. And so I've there, there's some routes that... I, it's it's also funny, uh, you know, your brain kind of thinks about cities differently. In North America, my brain was fixed on a grid and I was thinking, okay, I can go this way and then turn left. But if I want, I can turn left first and then turn right and I'll get to the same spot. You can't do that here because the streets aren't a grid. But you start to think in terms of landmarks. Like I know the efficient way to get from this landmark to that landmark. And it's through this winding set of streets or, you know, whatever. It, it's basically those Hofner roads. Um, and you start to think about it that way. Like, Okay, I know the closest the closest landmark I know is over here, so I'm just gonna pop over to there, however I can. And then once I'm there, I know how to get from that landmark to this other landmark near my destination. Uh, and that's how I mentally think about it now. Right. Um, but I've got some of these routes in my head where I can go two, three, four, five kilometers and never hit a single traffic light or stop sign. Right. And what a difference that makes for cycling! Like it yeah. really, really does. Uh, when I drive, I have to go to every single stoplight. But when I'm on a bike, stoplights and stop signs aren't necessary for bicycles, and they design it that way. Yeah. But once you start getting this concept that bicycles can take these different routes, you can also do as Amsterdam has done, prioritize those routes to have absolutely nothing to ever stop you. Like unless you happen to get to an intersection where you're going to have to pause for a moment because another bike's coming or maybe you're crossing a car route, um, you just go. And... And to be able to cycle for like literally half an hour and never stop is unreal. And I'm not talking about like out in the country somewhere on a mountain bike trail. I'm talking about in the city. Right. It makes just such a difference. It's, it's, it's really incredible. Well, one of the things that I absolutely adore about uh, riding in the Netherlands is, is also their strategic use of roundabouts. And, and I know yeah. that that was one of the topics that I had pitched to you to, to talk a little more deeply about. Notice how we didn't get to that. <laughs> but yeah, maybe next time. Maybe next time. But I, I mean, it's just, it, it's so, because so often, you know, when you are at one of these ridiculous, you know, signalized intersections and you're sitting there and, and the bikes are piling up and you're like, if this were a roundabout, we would be through here already. Yeah. And there's and there's several different treatments uh, for those listening in and 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 watching this video. We're not talking about a typical North American roundabout, and we're not talking about the massive, massive, you know, traffic circle things that are, are you know that you've seen, you know, <laughs> videos of of the insanity of of multi multi lane uh, traffic circle yeah. things. W w these are very very well thought out Dutch. Uh, roundabout designs. Many of them are bike and pedestrian priority facilities. 
And in, in, if, when you're looking at it from above, it, it you know the bicycle infrastructure and facility, uh, since the the cycle paths are oftentimes completely removed from the roadway or the road mm-hmm. itself, it looks more like it's a it's a square for from a cycle you know perspective in in many mm-hmm. cases, not always, but uh, really truly phenomenal how well that system works and. Uh, so I, I know that I will eventually dive deeper into that, but uh, your, your thirty second reflection of what it's been like for you to you know hit some of the roundabouts that you hit at least on a regular basis. Yeah, well, uh, where I live, there aren't a huge number of roundabouts, but yeah. I do sometimes get out to New Vest, um, especially uh, if I when I. Uh, I well, I used to take my son out there to go to swimming lessons. Uh, oh, thankfully. you did! Didn't you do thankfully, a live thing of hitting a bunch of roundabouts? Uh, I did actually. I did yes. on NJB Live. That so anybody listening who wants to see my live stream channel, I do live streaming from a bicycle, okay. um, and uh, it's called NJB, as in not just bikes. NJB Live on YouTube and uh, not just bikes on Twitch. Um, yeah, I did do one with uh, with roundabouts in Amstelveen. Um, the, I don't. I well, I guess I go out to Amstelveen every few weeks too. Uh, I I do get around with some roundabouts. Now that I think about it, I do actually at least once a week. I ride in some of the areas with roundabouts, and I mean, <laughs> they're really really easy. They almost always have bicycle priority, um, and y- you know you got to be careful with a roundabout um, that that the drivers are paying attention. But in general it's really, really easy. And th- there's, uh, th- this is a whole other topic unto itself, but yeah. the, but the short bit is that on roundabouts, bicycle infrastructure is set back a little ways from the exit. Um, so there's enough room for a car to exit the roundabout and wait there before right. the feet's bad. And that's what makes the big difference because drivers in roundabouts have to pay attention to a lot of, there's a lot of moving parts, right? Like you're, you're exiting, you have to make sure someone else is not coming in there cars in different directions it's slow speeds but there is still a lot going on with the roundabout the the idea that you can exit the roundabout and stop and then look for the cyclists makes a huge difference because as a driver you concentrate on i'm in the roundabout i have to watch for the other cars i exit the roundabout then i can look for the bikes so it's like i'm done looking for the cars now i look for the bikes and pedestrians who are the pedestrian zebra crossing is right after the uh the feet spot so it, it really makes a huge difference because there's the cars spinning around the roundabouts, but then they'll slow down as they exit. And that's right when you're coming up with a bicycle. So there's lots of time for people to react. Um, and it's just not scary at all. Um, it's, and what's great it's about that, that uh, live that you did um, is that you were able to see some of the different types, uh, some of the yeah. older ones and some of the, yeah. you know, and then some of the newer, more improved ones. And so one of the yeah. great things about the Dutch is that they're always trying to fine tune their infrastructure and, and trying to find the yeah. safest, most efficient way of, of putting everything together. And, and uh, that's a good example of that. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, it is improving all the time and you see it when you ride, especially in Amsterdam, like we, I mentioned it earlier in this, you'll see sometimes some streets that maybe aren't the best infrastructure because they're 30 years old. And I know some people knock Amsterdam for being inconsistent, you know, but it's not, yeah, they can sometimes be a little bit inconsistent, but it's improving. So I don't mind that kind of inconsistency when it's improving. It's not like in North America where it's inconsistent because they're like, oh, geez, we don't want to take away space for parking. So let's just make a crappy bike lane here. Like that's bad inconsistency. Right. Good inconsistency is we did this kind of thing. It was okay, but now we could do it better. So the next road over is going to be better. I mean, that's the kind of inconsistency you want, right? <laughs> yeah. And, and it does mean because roads only get upgraded every 30 years or so, it does mean that there can be non-optimal designs kicking around for 30 years but at least i know that when the road gets um uh when there's construction when the road gets resurfaced i know it's going to come back better than before and that's good good stuff good stuff jason thank you so much for joining me once again on the active towns podcast thank you it's been good to talk to you
thank you also very much for watching this special holiday bonus video. I hope you enjoyed this conversation with Jason and found these insights helpful. To learn more about the videos and concepts we discussed, check out the video description below. Well, that's all for this week's bonus video. But before I let you go, just a few quick reminders. The regular podcast is taking a break for the holidays. Yes, I mean it this time. <laughs> but I'll be back on January 7th with a conversation featuring Leonard Nout of MobyCon in the Netherlands. And yes, we will be talking a bit about Dutch style roundabout design. And if you miss my holiday live streaming get together with Ryan Van Duzer from this past Monday, December 20th, click on over and give that recording a watch. And finally, please help me to grow the culture of activity movement by making a donation to Active Towns, spreading the word, and subscribing right here on YouTube. Thank you all so very much for your support and for tuning in. Until next time, this is John signing off by wishing you much activity, health, and happiness. Cheers, and happy holidays. <laughs> <laughs>